I, I think that um, for me, ministry is life. Uh, and it's just, if I, if I can't give, then it feels empty. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we are, we have freely received from Christ, we now give. Mm -hmm. And ministry looks different for every single person. I always say that if you are working at a job somewhere and you pour concrete all day or whatever you do, you're still in the ministry. Welcome to In Light of the Gospel. This is episode 71. I just met a man this morning. His name is Kobe Weeb, and I sat down with him here and did an interview. I had never heard of him, never known him before. Just met him on the fly. Somebody introduced me and said, hey, you've got to talk to this guy. He came from Manitoba. He was here for a men's encounter and uh, is off to Paraguay for another one. And he operates out of Arburg, Manitoba. He's a missions pastor at his local congregation there and uh, has a real passion for reaching Mennonite people, the Plot Dietsche speaking people. But his central theme and his highlight message, his life message is uh, identity in Christ. We didn't get into that too, too much in this podcast, but we get his background, his upbringing and how he came to this kind of ministry. So I hope you'll be blessed by it and I hope you pass it on to all your friends and that people will understand and know a little bit more of Christ because of Kobe's testimony. God bless you. I, I, my first thought was when I heard your name was that if your name is Kobe Weeb, then probably you were not from Mexico because there's a lot of Mennonites in Manitoba in particular that never mm -hmm. moved to Mexico. They just kind of stayed in Manitoba, That's right? right yeah. So I assumed... You were uh, one of those Canadian Mennonites. <laughs> the Canadian Mennonite. Turns out yeah. I was wrong. Yes, that's right. I was born in Mexico. Which area? Raised uh, in Swift Colony in Chihuahua. Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, it was one of those proud Swifta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My mom was from there, apparently. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I grew up in Mexico and at age 22 moved to Canada and got married. Gotcha. At, in Alberta at the time. Yeah. And then moved to Manitoba in 20, 2002. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, born and raised in Mexico, obviously, Plotich was your main language. That's all you spoke growing up? Uh, yes, uh, initially. But then it, in my teens, uh, around 15, let's say so, 16, then uh, the school started with English classes okay. during the summer. Yeah. And so there's teachers from the U.S., from Florida and from Kansas and from the Amish, uh, Beachy Amish churches there, we had um, teachers come, so I went to the English school. What kind of school did you go to then? Uh, well, I, I grew up in the Kleine Gemeinde Church, so there was Kleine Gemeinde okay. schools, and they started with the English classes. Yeah. Uh, in the mornings for children, and then in the evenings for youth and adults. Gotcha. Um, so initially it was in the mornings, from nine to 12, so that was six weeks every summer. Gotcha. I, sometimes when I think about the older generation Mennonites, like my parents and stuff, it, it almost seems to me that we have this idea that they were less educated. Maybe the previous generation was, mm. but I just went to Mexico for the first time really this past January, and my mm. cousin's children speak, f speak, read, and write four languages. Yes. They can yeah. speak English fluently, Plotich, mm -hmm. High German, Spanish, mm -hmm. and I'm like, uneducated what i think i'm an uneducated one yes that's right oh so, so you can probably speak and write at least two or three languages too yes i would be in all of those four i think fairly fluent although my spanish seems to uh fall asleep yeah yeah if you're not using it yeah i every time i go to mexico then i it wakes up a bit more but yeah. um right now it would be stuttering a bit gotcha. in that language but so you weren't raised old colony at all not at all, no. Because um, Plenty Mind is a fair bit different down there. Mm -hmm. So my dad used to be an old colony preacher and quit, or he was kind of pushed out of that thing uh, at my age too. So I don't remember any of that. Gotcha. But yes, in, uh, that was in Swift Colony and everything kind of broke apart and then a lot of the people moved to Bolivia that yeah. at that time. And so he, my dad was, yeah, pushed out. Uh, he was challenging the eldest a bit yeah. with the each uh, excommunication part. Yeah, the hydro came in and the tires came in, uh, and every every Sunday there was tons of people being excommunicated. And so he asked the eldest "What are you going to do once you, once everyone is going to be excommunicated?" Because the power was lost; they were, people didn't listen. 
Yeah. Anyway, so that was not a good welcome. I see. And and so he kind of was hurt, stayed home for a number of years. But then at that time, the Kalingi Mini Church from Kauai's came in and started churches, church plants. Swift being one of the, I'm not sure if the first, but one of the first ones. And my older siblings and my mom started going to church. And so me as a two, three year old, probably four by that time, I don't know, was just taken along. Yeah. For the first time, you could actually take kids to church. Right, right. <clears throat> I, I guess we should almost give some people the background if people don't know that culture at all. When the electricity and rubber tires and all that came into those colonies mm -hmm. back then, a lot of men, even to this day, I remember growing up realizing that there were some men in the Elmer, Ontario, Old Colony Church that were Utschlutten. I mean, like they, they could not go to church because ah, yeah. mm -hmm. they had a ban on them. Right. And you find out that it was because 40 years before, they had had a tractor tire with, yeah, with rubber yeah, tires yeah. on, mm -hmm. or they brought electricity into their mm -hmm. home or something. And now, even though the whole church had now gone with it, they were mm -hmm. all doing rubber tires, they right. still didn't lift that ban because that guy had been rebellious uh, yeah. during that time, right? <laughs> so, Yes, big, uh, big deal, right? Yeah. And yeah. the idea that children don't go to church. Yes, oh yeah, that's that. I guess that was, back in the day, a big deal, or like... I don't know at what age, maybe at age 12. I think so. Somewhere along the line that children were allowed to come to church. Um, and so I I have nothing in my background of that. Like I have always been to growing up in the Klein United Church and that school. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I went to school to a different, like eventually I finished the Klein United School and I wanted to continue. So then I went to the United Gottes Church School in... in um, uh, Nashtit. Okay. Anyway, and uh, finished grade six there. So I had done nine years of school and then I backed up, started grade five and grade six because they had more Spanish and they were registered with the government. Gotcha. Then after that, I was a teacher for one year. Okay. Back at the Klangy Money School. And then I realized that if I want to be a teacher, I better get educated. So I went to the junior high or secundaria in, in Blumno with the General Conference Church. Yep. Three years there. And then I was 20 years, and my dad said, I'm done paying tuition fee for you. Okay. <laughs> it was time to stop going to school. And so that was the end of school, and I kind of cried because I so loved school. Okay. In my friendship circle, in my community, there was others that went further, but where I come from, or where, especially my family, I was by far the most educated person at that time. I see. And um, went to be a teacher. And I loved, so I loved teaching. And I, so yeah, that, that whole old colony, so that culture I grew up in, right? Just not that church. So if you go back to, say, childhood, a lot of the guys that I have on this channel grew up old colony. And when I ask them, what were your thoughts about God as a child? Typically, I would say probably 80% of them would say, I was afraid. I didn't, I was scared to go to bed at night sometimes. I was scared during thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if God was angry at us or... You know, or if they did something bad, they would have this, you know, ta terrible guilt and shame and all yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. What was the culture like growing up in your home? Did your dad get saved or was there talk about uh, the gospel? Yes. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very positive. I, I, I don't really know exactly at what point my dad got saved, but I am confident that he was saved. Mm -hmm. And he was very concerned about the gospel and that his children would learn to know the gospel in Salvation was an, an important part for him. Um, so at home, it's not that we had, or like some people would have their daily morning devotions as a family and all those kind of things. That never happened at us. Uh, praying out loud wasn't happening either. Okay. Somehow that was... Still an old colony thing. Yeah. yeah, my dad was a bit uncomfortable with that, I guess. But we grew up with having all kinds of like Bible discussions with my dad. And, and we would see him reading the Bible a lot. And, and mm -hmm. so that was not... Um, fear we would debate or talk about certain things a lot yeah um uh, especially me i i somehow had an interest in in that um so i i think we we grew up in in that sense a very a wonderful home in that sense i think um i was never afraid really like yeah. thunderstorms god there was no fear in that part uh sure those old wives table fables or whatever like certain things and if it thunders if it's certain lightning strikes then 
or bird flies in the window. Those yeah, common those superstitions. Those were things that were talked about, but everybody knew that was not true. But I it was see. just like somebody said so. Yeah. So do you remember thinking about God and afterlife and all that at a young age? Yeah. Um, I got saved at, I want to say, around seven or eight years old. Okay. I remember we had a revival meetings in church one evening. And uh, there was an altar call. Um, and, of course, the altar call was, I knew I was too young. Like, there was, that was for the old people. Uh -huh. I, I wasn't welcome to go forward. But it was asked to come forward uh, at the altar call. And so a number of the youth would go forward and... But I didn't. I, I, I that I didn't there too. Uh, but I prayed in my seat mm -hmm. for Jesus to come into my heart, and I just remember about how, still very vividly on the feeling like a peace flooded my soul, and I was just so happy and mm -hmm. peaceful. And I remember then saying, "Talk at home, talking about it," and I, that part I I was like almost like ridiculed a little bit from my older siblings and. Like, it's not an well, you got still too young. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you don't know what you're talking about. You just want to attention or something. Yeah, that hurt a bit, right? I like so I was quiet. I didn't dare talking about it anymore. And then I had my ups and downs, but but so the desire to follow Jesus was right from the beginning. And I, I sure have rededicated or whatever yeah, different yeah. Old, uh, revival meetings that were there yearly and so on, but. Uh, as far as I can remember back at uh, around seven or eight years old, that's where I would have yeah. done my... Yeah, there's there's a lot of kids that do commit their lives to God or ask uh -huh. Jesus to come into their heart simply out of this is what people do or mm -hmm. they're scared of hell or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But then there's others who just genuinely at four, five, six, eight years mm -hmm. old, they seem to understand Christ died for my sins and he rose again. And now he can live inside my heart, and they just they love the idea, right? Mm -hmm. and it's yeah, it's exactly. a search for truth. So, absolutely, for me that was I think that was the case. I obviously didn't fully understand it. Yeah. Um, but I I wanted to follow Jesus, and I at whatever childlike faith I prayed, and I still remember the feelings and so on. Yeah. Did you end up having, uh, like you said, some ups and downs? Did you have like a, a rebellious teenage phase still too, or not really? I wouldn't say rebellious. No, I, my heart always wanted to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I know it was hard at the time, at probably around twelve years old. I remember that that somehow it didn't find. I didn't feel appealing to follow Jesus. It was so hard to do the right thing, where all my friends did their other things, and that seemed to be fun. So I that was one season where I'm like, okay, God. I'll just do something else in between. But I was never doing bad things or like, I just, uh, there, there was no, like the alcohol, I've never drank, never smoked, uh, those kind of things. Party wasn't a thing I did. Okay. I, interv I interviewed a guy here last week. He said he got drunk for the first time and I want to say it was 11 years old. And oh then from there, it was just the progression, just drinking in, oh drink, dear, oh in dear. Mexico. Like that <laughs> yeah, no. just how it was there. So you were able to stay away from a lot of the trouble. I have been saved from a lot of trouble. Amen. I know at around 15 or 16, I had my first smoke. And <laughs> I smoked about half a cigarette. Yeah. And I was coughing my lungs out. And I said, this is it. I'm if not it, doing that. I'm anymore. not doing this again. So yeah. I threw the whole thing out and that was it. I see. And I knew in my heart that this is not a good thing. I see. And um, those friends, and then, so the friends that I had, some village, some are neighbor friends, I kind of went off, like deviated from that and said, this is not my friend. Interesting. I, I for myself, was one of the uh, schmucka oknia. I never, uh. never drank, never smoked a cigarette, never touched, and never went to parties, oh, never wow. slept around. Like, I actually didn't go to Mormon. Yeah, yeah. And even got baptized, went through all the right steps, uh -huh. and then I got saved at 21. I, I had <laughs> no concept of the gospel, mm. no understanding of the free gift of grace yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. righteousness, nothing like that, right? I, obviously, I knew Jesus had died, that he had risen again. But what that meant to me, no idea. Mm. It, didn't, it didn't have any personal foundation or meaning to me. So okay, wow. It wasn't until I was twenty-one. Okay, wow. I in that sense, I would say the church I grew up in, they salvation was always taught. Like especially if they had like revival meetings yeah, and stuff, mm -hmm. right? That was always a big part of it. And uh, for me, I I don't know. I guess I've understood somewhat of that from right in the young age. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I have never been one that stayed home in the sense of church. I always had my foot in almost every church. Okay. As soon as I could, I I went to different churches. Just to see what else was there, who else? Were. I Yeah, I was always curious. Yeah. What do they do and how does it look? And the thing is, I enjoyed music. And so then the other churches had music. So then I know that the United Gospel <coughs> Church, I would go there. They had evening services. So I would on Sunday nights, I'd go there. And then mm -hmm. Sunday mornings, it was my home church and so on. And of course, I was a bit criticized over that, especially after I was baptized and, and was a Sunday school teacher and, okay. and so on. And so if, if you got ba uh, saved probably seven or eight, how long did you wait to get baptized? I was, I want to say, twenty years old. Okay, and that was a little bit out of of, of spite or anger, maybe. At seventeen, I wanted to, but my mom said I was too young. I see. And all my friends did, and so I had to stay home when they went had brotherhood meetings or when they had communion. You know, like there wasn't, and and so that that turned into a little bit of an, a bitterness or an anger. And I said, good, if I'm too young, then I will wait. Mm. And so at age 20, my mom was like, okay, rest in hotel <laughs> And I'm like, no, nope, you, you sh I was too young before, we'll wait. Okay. Anyways, but eventually I figured I gave in kind of thing. And yeah. So, whatever, I, uh, I had gone to, you mind, I got to school. I had been to the Bloom Nose General Conference Church School. And while at that school, I visited that church a lot in their youth meetings. Um done to different youth retreats or different churches so i never had church walls were very transparent okay to me we are the church of god yeah and if you get together here and you get together here that doesn't really make a difference to me right um it's all about jesus christ and, and building his kingdom and i went Wherever that was, that's probably up. what's led you to be a missionary pastor. I would imagine. Uh, I I like the idea of committing to a local body to mm -hmm. where you're there to help them, but at the same time recognizing that there's Christians in all mm -hmm. these different groups and people who genuinely believe. Yeah. in what's the problem, right? I'm one hundred percent. And today, I I wouldn't necessarily say that that was probably the best thing. I'm just gonna click something off here. You can keep talking if you want. So I uh, went in back then did, but I think it I learned a lot through that yeah and learned a little bit about the church politics that happens normally so today I would probably not recommend that necessary you mean visiting around too yeah, much. yeah. never having a home I, I love the idea of having your home and you are plugged in in your own church mm -hmm. supporting and doing that but I'm also very okay not having very strong walls like that working together with other churches, doing events together with other churches. I I still believe that if we are for Christ, then we should somehow be able to work together with other believers yeah. in building God's kingdom on earth. Yeah. Um, that's still a strong belief of mine. And so if we are very strong, like this, this is who we are, and we're working with us only, um, and have our dis disagreements over minor things. Sure. Then we major on the minors. I, I heard years ago one preacher, he put it open-handed, closed-handed type of issues, right? Where mm -hmm. a Christian is someone who accepts the closed-handed things, like Christ is God. Mm -hmm. uh, he did die for our sins. Right. He rose again from the yeah, dead. Yeah. And he, he was born of a virgin birth. Mm -hmm. He's ascended to heaven. He's coming back. Like the stuff that you have to believe yeah. to be a Christian. Then there's other stuff, like what do you believe about the end times or mm -hmm. even exactly how creation happened. And a lot of these open-handed yeah, issues. Yeah. You can even be in the same congregation and hold different things with the open hand. Yeah, yeah. But usually, a congregation kind of gathers around a certain set of open-handed issues. Yeah. Like, we believe this about this. Mm -hmm. But then, with other churches, as long as they still hold to those closed-handed issues, the fundamentals, yeah, like yeah. what makes someone a Christian, then we can interact with each other, and we can mm -hmm. serve together, or do events together, whatever mm -hmm, else, mm -hmm. right? 100%. If if it's a salvation issue, that I think we should. That's where we the, yeah. what you call the close hand of things. If it's a salvation issue, that's where we want to be very clear about. But then all the other things, how you do church services, uh, if you like music or not music, mm -hmm. um, what kind of music. That's those are minors. They they don't. That's not. There might be sometimes wisdom in one way or the other, yeah. but it's not a sin issue or a salvation exactly, issue. Yeah. yeah, that's good. 
yeah, that's how I feel anyways. In the, uh, so, yeah, I've always been very, very plugged in in church. Yeah. Especially after getting married, I was song leader in the youth right away and then didn't didn't take many months. I was song leader in church and then I was youth leader in church and then been very plugged in. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before you rededicated your life maybe multiple times. Or mm -hmm. Was there any kind of like a, a real pivotal time in your maybe your later years, teenage years or 20s where you just felt like I need to serve God. I want to completely give my life to something or was it just kind of a constant direction in that way? I don't remember a very pivotal time. I know that in back oh, in the early 90s, maybe. We had um, in the Swift Colony, they started off with uh, what we call Spekka for Okay. Not in a church. It was uh, probably the General Conference Church put it on, I think. And yet there was various things happening that time where in, in a big, some farmer who had a big... Um, Spekka barn. Mm -hmm. and, and they would ha have church evening services there. Okay. Kind of trying to step outside of a church wall. I think that helps visitors come in, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I remember one of those where, where, and I don't remember who the pastor was, that wasn't, I don't remember, but I remember one of those altar calls and I sat beside a friend and I hadn't thought of anything. I didn't think of going forward because I was saved. So I didn't really, didn't feel that I needed to go forward. Mm -hmm. My friend though, he asked me, uh, are you gonna come with me if I go forward? And I just just said yes. And later on, <laughs> as we walked up forward, I felt a bit odd. Being like, okay, it looks like I will. I'm now being, yeah, getting like this decision is for me. I'm now deciding to become a Christian. Well, I was saved. That wasn't the big thing, but I remember that there something gripped me and like, okay. I definitely realized, okay, I, I could probably be, I didn't do everything right or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that was a pivotal enough that I remember clear those details. Yeah. Um, probably, I was probably also one of my last times where I would have considered I need to rededicate or whatever. Okay. And again, part of that is, I think, understanding in, 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 in a somewhat childlike faith or whatever. At that time, I was probably 15, 16. 14, I don't remember exactly, mm -hmm. but um, the re-saving happened a lot, right? Every every revival meeting, like it was drilled down. Like, oh, yeah. <clears throat> if there's one sin, if you made one oh, mistake, yeah. you better. Like no especially, sin enters heaven. And, especially churches that have a bit of the works mentality yeah. still creeping in, right? And, and grace wasn't necessarily preached a lot. It was, I mean, yes, we're saved by grace. But then if there's one sin in your life, then you're condemned. So it's a, I would say it's a, a saved by grace, but kept by works. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's just as much of a problem because there's never a single day in my life where I could look at my whole day and say, yeah, I think I'm saved. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would be lost again, <laughs> yes, right? Exactly. Every day. So yeah, no, exactly like you said. And, and as I got to understand a little bit better where I was at, and, and I suppose because I was in different um, churches, here mm -hmm. and there and, and and so back then there was no YouTube and there was mm -hmm. no internet the teachings you heard were via cassette tapes exactly my, my, my age yeah. <laughs> and uh, today many people might not even know what that is <laughs> but uh, no podcast so <laughs> no, that's right. so there was a limited amount of information you got to know yeah Maybe a good thing. But you were going to multiple churches. There must have been some churches in the area that also preached the gospel clearly and yeah. spoke about grace some. And, and, and I know that some churches, they would have literature, books, uh, commentaries, and those things. And I was always loving to have my hands on those. Mm -hmm. and so I, was, I have been a studying person right from young age. Gotcha. And um, read. I read more than most people would. Yep. And so I think... All of that, you it opens your mind, your horizon becomes bigger, and you understand things maybe from a wider perspective, yeah. to say. I would say I got saved at 21, and then got, uh, I've, I've called myself somewhat legalistic, where I, mm. I, same idea, where I was saved by grace, I knew that my sins were paid for, but now to maintain my salvation, I felt like I needed to be stronger, more dedicated, more holy, more godly, 
pray more, read more, mm-hmm. fast more, those kinds of things, no. right? And if I failed to keep up my standard of what I thought was right, mm-hmm. then I would feel guilt or shame or condemnation. And then all of a sudden, maybe two or three years into my Christian life, I got a solid teaching on grace and that I'm saved mm. and kept by his work right. alone and that it's Christ. You know, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. Mm-hmm. And that's that became the focus. And so I, I've even called my channel in light of the gospel because to me, the gospel is not something that you get saved with and then move on to more serious things. The gospel is the central theme of our whole lives. Mm-hmm. It's, it's only by grace that I was saved 20 years ago. And it's only by grace that I'm saved here today. And it's still the cross. I still mm-hmm. thank God for what Christ did on the cross mm-hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. It's still what keeps me, you know, in his mm-hmm. favor yeah. constantly. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you uh, get married then in Mexico yet? Not Mexico. Nope. Um, I was 21, I guess. And I went to visit Alberta. Okay. I had two sisters living in Alberta at the time. So Tabor somewhere. Yep. Yep. Southern Alberta. And so I went to visit them. And um, I guess there was a girl who was a teacher in their school. Mm-hmm. And I um, suppose my sister had a little bit to do with that. She was kind of t- hinting previously already. I, we have a teacher here, and I think you two would be wonderful <laughs> together. Of course, at that time when I heard that, I'm like, I hold nothing to do with that. Okay. So it was a little like, nope, I'll find my own girl. Yeah. So, uh, but we went to visit, and going there, I had absolutely zero thought. But I suppose... Oh, the funny thing is, and I think it's only God ordained, but when we, when I came to church, so it was kind of a surprise for my family. I arrived there on a Saturday, Sunday morning, I walk in the church. And all my cousins and, and, and some of the friends that I knew from that area, they would all ask him, oh, so you're coming for Annie? Uh, and I'm like, oh, who's Annie? What? What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. Like, it was like, Shut up already. <laughs> but it was every single one that I would meet. Oh, you're coming for Annie. I see. And like, I had never been there. I had never seen that girl. Like, how do I? Like, that was a bit of an annoying yeah, thing I for me. Yeah, I see that. So pointing out, oh, she, there she sits. And like, oh, whatever. It's just a girl. Just like, up to that point, girls had not been part of my life. Nothing. I, I had, like, I was as free as can be in that sense. I, I did not want to be tied down. I observed other friends. Oh, as soon as they had a girlfriend, they couldn't be part of the youth thing. They were totally distracted. Yeah, I'm like, no, that's not me. I want to enjoy everybody. I was a very kind of an outgoing, free spirit person. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the culture, like men are here, women are here. The separated in the youth. I was somehow that line was transparent. I had no problem after church when everybody's visiting outside of the church in their separate gender. I no problem going among the women and and, and talk to a woman. And, 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 and a lot of boys were like, how dare you? Yeah. How ain't strange, right? Because they were thinking about girls as partners, right? And you were just, yeah. they're just people. I was just like, they're friends. There's awesome people here. That's interesting. At youth doings, we would, um, I, I would be friends with every. I would dare talking to everybody. And it just wasn't this separation thing and... So I've been a kind of a leader right from the age. Like at youth, people would constantly ask me, hey, why don't you, when are we doing this? Or when are we doing this? I'm like, I'm not the youth leader, but I tended to organize things. Okay, yeah. uh, even early church, after getting married, then uh, people in the church would come to me and ask me, like, what does, it, what, what does the leadership say about this? Or like, what's going to be happening at our brotherhood meeting? And I'm like, why should I know that? Yeah. But I always knew. That's interesting. <laughs> I always knew. Somehow I had a relationship with, with the pastors of the church. It didn't, I mean, it helped maybe that my father-in-law was a pastor and was a kind of a missionary a, um, leader of that church or whatever. He planted the church, although he wasn't living there, but he was still very involved. Yeah, people knew you through that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But you first got sight of, of your wife. Did that slowly turn oh, into yeah. something, or was it a pretty quick change there, or all well, of a sudden you got fixated <laughs> on the girl? <laughs> it's still a strange story. Not quite sure how this all happened, but so I visited, and so I was there for a week and a half in, in Alberta. So by the end of that one and a half week, I had asked that girl to be my girlfriend. I see. <laughs> uh, never met her. We had only, I had visited with her once, twice during that one, a little bit. Yeah. And see, in her culture, 
I, as a boy, would ask the f have to ask the father yeah. to be able to date. Even get to know her. Yeah, to, yeah, and that was a strange concept for me. Okay. Like, how, what's that to him? Like, was it Kleine Meinde in Alberta too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was Kleine Meinde. What's that to him, eh? So I'm like, <laughs> it's so strange, but my sisters obviously were very instrumental in educating me. This is how you go about this. Uh -huh. You talk to that father. Here's our phone. You can call him because he lived in Manitoba and I was in Alberta, right? So I would call. Um, so it was all arranged. Big deal. Oh, <laughs> nerve wracking. Yeah, uh, I can uh, imagine. So I called and then my mother-in-law picks up the phone and I asked to speak to her husband, to my the, the girl's father. Well, he wasn't home. He was a pastor, so he was in Belize at the time doing evening mm. services. So I asked her. Of course, she was stuttering back and forth, didn't know what to say, and I was... I don't know what to say too, yeah. so I was quiet. <laughs> so finally, she said, "Well, it should work." She is, she, and she was twenty-four at the time. Your and wife she, was, yeah. Okay. And so she said, "Well, she is, she's not a child anymore, so she can." <laughs> this sounds good, out, Nate. So, like, awesome, good, thank you very much. Click. So anyway, it was a f funny thing, but yeah, I asked, and then I left. Of course, the only way communicating was phone calls or, or writing hand letters. What a difference now, eh? Man. And so December showed up, and I hadn't heard nothing from her. She had didn't say yes, but she said, "Let's let me pray about this, mm -hmm. and um, and maybe we can get to know each other a little bit." Would this have been like mid nineties, or this was in nineteen ninety seven, okay. October. Yeah, it was October thirty first when I officially asked her. Oh, we're coming right up on the anniversary. Yeah, <laughs> and then. Uh, and then by December twentieth or so, I had she hadn't heard nothing from me. Okay. And I hadn't heard nothing from her. Oh wow! And she's like, "Does this guy still think about this? Like, how do I know? I haven't heard nothing. He's in Mexico. I'm in Canada. What's?" Yeah. So then I got a phone call from my father-in-law, now father-in-law, asking like, "Are you? What's the deal? Like, have you? What's? You haven't called. You haven't said a word." Yeah. And, and I guess phone calls were for emergencies. Yeah, you don't just call somebody, especially long distance, right? Right. I mean, my parents had a phone, but the cost was so extreme. It was over a dollar a minute. And so it had really crossed my mind to mm. call. And I, it was un immature in my end, I think. But so, see, my sister had, was going to come to Mexico for Christmas or just after Christmas. And so they would bring her. Annie, my girlfriend at the time, or my hope to be girlfriend, yes, <laughs> along so that she could see my family. Yeah, and so I'm like, but she didn't know. Like, is he still wanting to? Yeah. Anyway, long story short, he yes, I want her. She comes along, and then it's where my family gets to meet her, and and a lot of my family had no clue. It was set strictly silent. Nobody would know. I have no clue why, but they were like shocked. Except my parents, they knew. Yeah. That there's this girl that that Kobe's wanting. Flew across the country to, or <laughs> yes, <laughs> from two countries. So away. here she was. Uh, it was a bit awkward. She hadn't said yes. We were not really a couple. Yeah. We were not boyfriend girlfriend. But anyway, so that's how it all started. Yeah. <clears throat> you got married then when you moved to Canada. Yeah. So then in June I moved back, moved to Canada, and then in October we got married. October tenth. So. It was uh, less than 12 months later mm -hmm. from first seeing her to marrying. Interesting. And, and in those times, I was in Canada. We were in the same province for seven weeks. We were a long distance relationship. Yeah. Seriously. I wish that to nobody ever. Is that right? Um, we were strangers when we got married, uh -huh. practically. Yeah. And I mean, I was 22 at the time, she was 26. That part is, is all good, and the th good thing is we weren't quite y too young or whatever. Like, But uh, no, I mean, and it won't happen today with 
internet and all technology, cell phone yep. technology. But there, there is actually a pretty real sense in which almost everybody, when they get married, are almost complete strangers mm-hmm. to each other. Because when you're dating, you're putting on your very best show. Yes, absolutely. You're dressing up right. You're cleaning up the car just right. You're presenting yourself in such a way. Mm-hmm. I've said this to young couples all the time. Like You think your boyfriend, your girlfriend is the perfect person. Mm-hmm. Talk to the little brother or sister once, and you'll find out that they're not so perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. just they've showed you that. Then you get married, then you let the guards down, a year or two goes by, maybe even the first year, all of a sudden you see them in their worst positions mm-hmm. and their yeah, worst yeah. places, you know, and then all of a sudden you get to know them for real. And I think that's supposed to be, like I, I often use this illustration, you know, when you first get married, it's like you're rubbing each other the wrong way, slowly those rough edges get mm-hmm. rubbed off and then you're supposed to mesh together yeah, and exactly. become this one cohesive unit. So even though you didn't know each other well, had only spent seven weeks in the same province, my wife and I had dated for almost two years, but still... After we got married, all of a sudden it was like, oh man, who is this person that I'm no. married to? So, no, we had a lots of um, lots of learning, eh? Lots of learning, man. Oh my, the first three months I remember were so much. You're nervous almost every day. You lived in this, like, who's this? And uh, driving, like, on our honeymoon, I, I was quiet a lot of time. There was so much to process. Yeah. It's like, what did I do? That I really want to say, do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy it's, it's really crazy yeah, um, awesome. we had our share a little bit of struggles because of that and initially mm-hmm. trying to get to know each other in one sense we would always say oh it was good but looking back I'm like man it was stressful mm. because we were so strangers yeah. um, but praise God I think the way it worked I never doubted that she would marry here and she had 100% sure in her mind I'm not marrying this guy nope I, I don't want him and I had never a doubt that she's gonna say yes to it um, eventually she said yes let's get to know let's start dating let's get to know each other but still it was a bit of a I'm not sure if, it, if this is what we want mm-hmm. but in, in essence after she said yes for the dating she had made up her mind okay if I say yes to the dating part that means also that's, yes to the marriage that's uh, most likely for future yeah. marriage yeah. and uh yeah, I think that's uh, life started. Yeah, I was a teacher. She was a teacher in a school there. And you were teaching now in Alberta? Yeah. Okay. The first year, not. So, got married in October, so the school had started, and they had all their teachers they needed. At the In March of that year, then I started teaching German in a public school. and um, But then the following school year, I started teaching. Gotcha. My English was a bit rusty. I had an accent, still have, but it was pretty... You had learned some English in school already in Mexico, but yeah. now you realized it wasn't quite up to par. Eh? Well, the speaking part especially. Like, I learned to read, write, and understand, mm. but the speaking, we didn't oh, have yeah. practice, right? Well, I think of my own plot teach. I can read plot teach, and I can have a conversation, but very often when all of a sudden there's a thought that comes to my head, I'm like, I don't know how to say this. It just doesn't want to come out. Yeah, yeah. So we... Uh, but it didn't take very long. I was able to correct my students and learn a lot. And it, it, it helped. My wife, her plotage was a bit rusty. Mm. And so I had to learn English fast and she learned plotage. There you go. And so it's... And, and, and coming from Mexico at that time, we had pushed and pushed so hard into high German. Like correct high German. We had teachers from Germany and we were as a teacher, we would take evening classes to l- learn high German properly. So your high German was a lot better than your English? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Here in Old Colony, I learned to read high German in Sunday school. Oh, wow. And so I knew the vocabulary. We repeated the all, 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 I, mm-hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. So I could read the, the old... Um, the old catechism mm-hmm. and stuff like that with the old... Oh, the, the Gothic lettering, yeah. Gothic lettering and all that. But I would read it <clears throat> and and almost mm-hmm. nothing went into my head because mm-hmm. it was just memorization. I yeah, didn't know yeah. what the words meant. <laughs> yeah. So did you have children fairly soon after your marriage? Uh, not very soon. We It took four years. Okay. Yeah. With some uh, complications. Yeah. Uh, but uh, eventually the doctors found out what the problem was. So, yeah, it... After four years, we had our first child, and so we have three, three daughters right now. Okay, three and girls. They're, they're all fairly grown up then. Yeah. So the oldest is twenty two, just about, and twenty and eighteen. Okay. Oldest two are right now in school and the university, 
One is going for teacher, the other one is for hairstylist, and the youngest is just graduated, so she's still at home. Gotcha. That's yeah. very much like our oldest. She's 21 and then 19 and 17, mm -hmm. so they're similar. Okay. Age. Yeah. And then we have four more after that. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you've been planning your money the whole time still? No. Officially? So at, in 2002, when we moved away from Alberta to Manitoba, mm -hmm. that's where we changed churches. My in-laws were, they, they had changed church. They weren't and part of- was a minister? Yes. So the Klein United Church in, Alberta, in Manitoba at the time, there had been a, a new district built. So like they had divided into a new district. The building was too full, so they built a new building and we're gonna start a second church, Klein United Church. But that had changed direction very quickly. And so with whatever complications there were about my, in-laws had and their family all had moved over to the new church and logically we were just going to be part of that church mm -hmm. that my in-law family was all part of right and so that's where we're still today and that's in the winkler area no this is an arborc arborc manitoba it's an hour and a half an hour good hour north of winnipeg okay of winnipeg yeah yeah okay and now how far from winkler so from us to winkler it's two and a half hour drive okay mm-hmm Gotcha. Yeah, there's quite a few Dicha in Arbor mm -hmm. too, right? There's yes, it's it has grown over the last ten years quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely, it's an increase. I had a friend uh, probably about four or five years ago move from here to Winnipeg, and uh, he's he was training to be a pastor. He's now a pastor in BC, but um, we were looking at the stats back then. The, their stats say that Winnipeg is the coldest city in Canada. Well, I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Oh. How, how difficult was that getting used to coming from Mexico? Oh, man. But at that time, I didn't think as much about it. I think they said 112 days of minus 20 or something. Yeah, that could be about right. Yeah, Averaging. It's if we have a minus twenty in Manitoba, we think it's good. It's that's pretty good. Let's go outside and have some fun. <laughs> yeah, if we have minus, that, that that's that's a that's a good winter day. Yeah, we definitely have our share of minus twenty, minus thirty or forty. Normally, there's always a a week or two of minus forties. Yeah, um, that's not fun. Uh, those times. here, if we get a week or two of minus twenties, that's extreme because uh, it's so wet here too. Oh, right, it just, you exactly. can hardly do anything yeah, outside. Yeah. It's very cold. And exactly over there, the colder it gets, the drier the air is, so it doesn't feel as cold. Yeah. Uh, but everybody knows, no towing around. Like if you have trouble outside, like like yeah, dress yeah. up, you will not. You're not going to survive yeah, out there long. It doesn't take very long. So did this new church take on a different denomination, or is it just a totally independent? It's it, it for the longest time it was an independent, non-denominational church, and in, in in a sense it is still. Although they have joined a network, LifeLinks network, of churches, so it's still a non-denominational church, and um, our church at this point is probably about I would say eighty percent Mennonite background people. Yeah, uh, a lot of them. Plotty just still the my age my age probably all somewhat speak Plotty, but their kids like mine they don't speak Plotty. I see. Well, I, I was surprised. I mean, I was at, I was still probably a teenager the last time I went, but I remember several other people going to Manitoba and walking into a Walmart and being greeted in Plotty in Winkler mm -hmm. area at oh, least, yeah. right? Where it's just everybody spoke Plotty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is still. I mean, again, Winkler has changed in the last mm -hmm. ten years a lot as well. Um, in Manitoba, you will you will never know who speaks Plotich. It might not look like Mennonite whatsoever, mm -hmm. but it's a high chance that they understand Plotich. I see. Yeah. Um, because the, the early Mennonites, like the Mennonites that never moved away, that stayed there, yeah. they might have a Mennonite name, but of course, that is already the second generation that does not speak Plotich. Their grandparents would have spoken Plotich, and they will know a few words. Yeah. But they might still be uh, Rhymer or Friesen. Yeah. And so that happens quite a bit. A lot, uh, many of them live in the city of Winnipeg and they all have, like, from a man like you will never expect them to have a government position or be a doctor or be mm. a lawyer There's or quite, a police. Quite a few hockey players now from yeah. Manitoba, that kind of thing. And, and those kind of things. But in Manitoba, that is a very common thing. Yeah, though. yeah. 
So this new church, uh, it was a pretty big group from the start, or was it a small group, and it just kind of got started? It started small. I don't know. We had, I would say, initially when I moved in, when we were part of it, we were around 80 people probably, yeah. and that was a year after they had started. You were teaching school again in Manitoba? No, not Manitoba. So in Alberta, I was. we lived there for four years after I moved in, so I was teacher the whole time. And then as soon as we moved to Manitoba, then I didn't teach anymore. So we lived in Manitoba for one year. Uh, I worked at a manufacturing business. Then moved to Mexico back, and I was going to teach there again. Okay. And I did, and was in uh, there for two years, was teaching, and loved it for the most part, and was also very involved. Started a music school, and um, was directing a men's choir, and like just very involved. Which church were you been part of then? That was the Klangemeine Church. Okay, good. In, in, in El Valle, Colonia El Valle in Mexico. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Um, and it was great. Uh, I have family there and I still go there every time we are them down. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's interesting to see when you start something that that church has a thriving music orchestra and choir and stuff. And to me, to look back, that I was a very key initial part in that. That's always enjoyable to see. The youth probably ha have no clue who I am and have no history awareness, <laughs> which is all good. But for me to just know, okay, something amazing came out of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's always fulfilling. What's the church there like now in Arburg? Uh, Lar large group, small group? Or? The, my, the church I attend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would probably be one of the largest churches there. We have normally about 400 people attending. Okay. Uh, our building is full, so we started with our second services because we were just too full. I see. So that's 400 between the services or yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh, it it dips in and out 390s to 400 and some we're yeah, kind yeah. of in that stage right that's now that's a big group that's a lot of influence so uh yeah it's uh, interesting and you were an elder kind of from the start yeah i would say fairly early on yeah mm -hmm. And um, the education that you had and the desire to study and to learn probably kind of pushed you into that direction pretty easily, naturally, eh? It was natural. I never knew even what an elder, even our church had no clue what an elder is at the time. Okay. Because the um, pastor at the time, he, he, he just wanted a different church government structure. Yeah. The, the whole idea of... of the way it was done and he grew up with it, having elections and voting in for every position and all that stuff he just didn't feel that was the best way to run a church right and he had some ideas on how he wanted it and that's where he asked so he was the lead pastor and kind of the only pastor for a while and he needed help and i mean he had a an associate pastor eventually because my father-in-law came in and um your so, father-in-law was the associate? Yeah. Okay. So, but then he felt, okay, there needs to be a little bit more. So he heard of the idea of elders. Yeah. And, um... I mean, it's right there in the text, right? But yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Somehow we missed some of that. And, uh, because he didn't, he, he didn't grow up with those, that term. Well, do, you, do you have, um... Maybe a quick little description as to why the voting in for positions is a little bit shaky, not very good standing. Like, why would you why would you recommend that people don't do that? Well, um, I want to say today that it it, it can it, it can work sure. well, but quite often or almost more often than not, it's not necessarily the best. It becomes a popularity contest. Yeah, and it's not necessary. So you get voted in, but you have no passion for this job that you got voted in, but now you have to do it. Yeah. And so he wanted it to be voluntary. Like, do you want to be a Sunday school teacher? Then come let me know. I would love to put you in. We'll look at you and see if you fit the bill. And, and yeah, exactly. Hey, we need ushers. Would you like to be an usher? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and of course, that comes with teaching. So you have to create a culture in order that to function well. So... The idea of serving in church is crucial then. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have, b before you have to serve because you're voted in. Yeah. Now, if nobody says I want to be an usher, then will there, there will be simply no ushers. Yeah. And, and in order to function properly, 
you have to create this culture in the church that serving is a wonderful thing. Interesting. I want to come and serve. Because <clears throat> growing up, to me, the idea of becoming a preacher was a very sad thing. Mm -hmm. Old colony preachers, they would change their clothes and dress, and they yeah. would weep and mourn and have like a, a funeral. A funeral. Almost, right? Their freedom was gone. And then I remember I got saved at 21, and I read the reading the Bible, and it says, he that desires the office of, office of a bishop desires a good work. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. A bishop, like if, you, if you want to be a bishop, that's a good thing. And yeah, I, yeah. And I remember very early on thinking, I want to teach. I, I love this idea of preaching and sharing and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And obviously at a very young age, you don't fit the bill yet, right? You, you didn't, you're still a novice and you, you yeah. haven't yeah. served well, but that's interesting. Yeah, and I knew from a young age that I would be in ministry of some sort. How, I don't know exactly. I mean, I remember in, as a kid, I was always playing preacher mm -hmm. my younger siblings had to be the congregants all the time <laughs> and i was always where were the you in the in the list of children uh so i grew up with five siblings um although i have six half siblings okay but there there was a big age gap between so there were 10 years in between my dad's wife passed away he I had see. six married again and had another five children and you were one of the older ones and so i was the second oldest from the from the five. five. Yeah, interesting. So you'd preach to them. <laughs> so I had, and then we would baptize cats. We would, uh, <laughs> we had to baptize something. Yeah. <laughs> so and I would marry. And cats probably enjoyed it too much. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, back in the day, it was always fun, of yeah. course. So, and in that sense, I not that that is a, call, a sign of a call. No, but, that's right. But nonetheless, I, I always saw that as a desirable thing. Yeah. I have looked at uh, when we, I remember at age 17, 16, and having a workshop. So as a teacher, teacher training and going to workshops and so on, and, and just loving the idea. And then just dreamed of me one day being able to be that professor, that the, the, the one that brings, that does the teaching at the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, just like, wow, I, that, that's a wonderful thing. And I, that, it's still there's, there's a bit of a, a funny line there right because the, there is something true where you could want it just to be the center of attention yep, yeah. and that's a pride thing mm -hmm. but you could also want it because you really want people to know the truth that you're seeing right and you have this drive to want to share it. and I think that's the same for myself where I'm like part of it from when I was young maybe it was a pride thing maybe it could still be a pride thing sometimes mm -hmm. but overall it's just like I'm reading this and I love what I'm reading I mm -hmm. want you to know it yep, and I yeah. just want to share it right the the a big part of that is, um, I would say, your t um, the gifting, right? Um, a teacher, normally, if you are gifted as a teacher, you might even know that you're a teacher, but if you have the desire, when you read something, you find out something new, and you're just like, wow, this is amazing, and your first thought is, how can I pass this on? Yes, exactly. That, that's a sign that you're a teacher. Mm -hmm. And that was, I would never, it feel, felt like I would never read something for me. I would learn something like, okay, I need to create a lesson of this. Mm -hmm. uh, or now it's like, oh, I read something, this has to go in a message somewhere. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> uh, it, it's always been like that. And uh, so, yeah, I have, as I was then becoming an elder, again, I was not voted in. Or my pastor, senior pastor couple came and asked ask if we... They've observed us, yeah. and we lo they loved what we were doing, how we were just passionate about serving people. And, and uh, we asked, like, what on earth is an elder? Uh, we, we had an idea what a deacon was, but an elder? Like, what's an elder in a yeah. church? Yeah. And he said, I don't know. Just, just we like what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. But we will give you the position of I an like elder. That. I like that. So whatever. He was learning. We were learning. It's not you're now going to try to do something that you've never done before. Yeah, no, we yeah. see that you have this desire and this drive and this passion and this gifting. Let's put you in the official position. Yeah. I think that. Yeah. No, it's a. It, it was a learning curve, and we were trying to figure out what is the role of an elder and what's the responsibility that we carry out and how should we. And, and it's been a long journey of trying to figure out and mm -hmm. and so on. And over the times and years, uh, we we learned a lot. We learned a lot. Our pastor at that time, soon after that, his wife, his wife became sick, had cancer, and died. Mm. And that really devastated the church. Yeah. And and it brought the pastor at that time into a depression, which we didn't know at the time. He was very good at hiding it. 
and so he uh, we as leaders of like as elders and deacons of the church we is, we should have told him take a, take time off yeah for sure to grieve and stuff but he or like the pastor he felt like he just continued you learn by making mistakes and so on yeah. so over the years we've learned a number of things of what an elder is and what it looks like and and during my years of being elder then so our pastor then moved away at some point in time and we kind of were without a pastor we were with a interim pastor and the church went through ups and downs and, and, and of course as elders you are now responsible to make sure things work and so you learn a lot and as the leader normally you get the you get the most glory but you also get the most blame for sure <laughs> and so at be, that be not many masters right they yeah. are greater condemnation so we we went through a, the church went through a little bit of a a few years of uh, all kinds of stuff and that's where we try to define a little bit of who's mm -hmm. who and what's what yeah, yeah. and so on so yeah well, that's uh, that's quite a story. I mean, I'm sure you and I just literally just met, so we could go on and on and on. But um, the way I got introduced to you was through Jake Fast. I had mm -hmm. Jake Fast on the podcast maybe about a year ago or less. I'm oh, not okay. sure. And uh, he's got quite a story of how he came to Christ. Mm -hmm. The men's encounter was very much involved with... I went to school in Sunday school with his brother, Abe, and he often watches the podcast too. So it was really neat to sit down with Jake and hear his story. And then he messaged me yesterday and said, hey, you've got to meet this guy, Kobe. <laughs> and so that's why I was thinking he's a Manitoba Kobe because that doesn't sound like a beach. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's I get that quite often. So because of the men's calendar ministry, I travel quite a bit. And how did you get involved with that? Well, I got invited by my my nephew from Mexico who had been attending in Texas a few times, and he says, "Kobe, I think you should go. You would enjoy it." And and I wanted to, but never happened really. And eventually, I did in 2018. I did. And instant by the end of that weekend, I knew this is something that I can really put my. You could pour yourself into. Yeah. And I started just doing it. I loved it, and um, have done it ever since. Um, so last year in July, we were in Bolivia for the first time and doing a men's encounter there. Okay. And um, a lot of people come out to that too. We had quite a few, yeah. And so we've had it twice now in Bolivia, and that was a wonderful wonderful experience man it's so refreshing and just satisfying to know to see some people find new truth and through that somehow find freedom yeah a lot of people that end up coming there seem like they're they're pretty deep into something right mm -hmm. some kind of addiction some kind of deep sin yeah, yeah. i mean we're all caught in some sin and we need help to get free some right. of it looks better than others mm -hmm. but a lot of times the ones that seem to come there end up being in a pretty dark place yeah a lot of those things, yeah, absolutely. And, and in such a, the event in is in such a way prepared, and the people that show up, it's very very non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. It's a safe place, and 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 we can, and people kind of get face to face with themselves, and and it's just opportunity for our freedom and find Jesus uh, there. Well, I, I've been asked on multiple occasions, do you endorse it? Do you support it? And I say, I don't really know. I've never actually been to one. I just have multiple friends who have been to it and came away with a new appreciation for what Christ had done mm -hmm. and, and the sacrifice for sins forever. You know, yeah. he took our sins and, and he was nailed to the cross and so on. And that, yeah. that leaves an impact on some people. So I, I'm sure... Like a lot of those events, sometimes it becomes too emotional, too driven this way or that way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, from the few people that I know, it seems like there's definitely been some fruit that's come out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's definitely some great fruit. Uh, the, like, it's a fact of life. Not everybody will stay like that. Yeah, yeah. Or even not everybody that goes there comes away with the most They might even story. make a fake profession sometimes. Yeah. You never mm -hmm. know, right? Absolutely. Not even every time. Almost every time somebody walks away not breaking through uh, they might be there to satisfy a spouse and say to just please somebody yeah yeah it's not of their own heart and so those people they will walk away unhappy and by now that's fine or whatever we we're not pushing anybody we're not forcing anything we are all an opportunity 
mm-hmm. if you want we are here to help you kind of thing walk when, through when you went to the first one was it pivotal for your own personal life or was it more just here's a way i think i can see a lot of people coming to faith no if to me it was mainly so i have been there so i can now start serving, serving. yeah okay because the program is you have to attend once before you can start serving there and i wanted to serve yeah and uh so, I mean, yeah, it took me, like, I am a person who has been giving and serving forever. And I love serving. So now sit there and being served by others was a bit hard for me. So, yes, I had to humble myself and being served. Mm-hmm. Those, that took some time. But I didn't go there because I felt I was in a dark place. No, no. Yeah. And... Uh, but you could see there how somebody who was in a dark place could maybe finally get the help. Absolutely, yeah. man. I knew very quickly this is a work of the Holy Spirit. There's no fancy messages. There's no uh, convincing st- preaching happening, nothing. Very down-to-earth, very, very basic. And yet the amount of people who actually respond to an altar call, the amount of people who respond to open up for prayer, like, whoa, this... There is no fancy speech or, like Paul says, persuasive words that cause you to somehow get emotional. And mm. no, that was, I knew instantly the Holy Spirit is at work here. Okay. And that caused me, like that I knew, okay, this this we can work with. Mm-hmm. And, and and so I've been part of it. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that you are a pastor of missions or something along those oh, lines, or missions pastor. Yeah. Is that connected at all to this? Or are you Kind of, not really. I mean, our church would support this ministry quite a bit because I'm very involved in there. Yeah. The, it was only last year in May, two years in May, two years ago maybe, that I was that I was ordained as the missions pastor. I've been like an elder, done lots of pastoral work in our church. And in our church, it wasn't necessary that you now had to be ordained as a pastor. You had to be this. It just so happened. I was there. And and so finally, but all these years of doing ministry all over the place with the encounters and going and serving in different regions and churches, the question came up quite often, are you a pastor? Like in the managed world, Best in Predia. Mm-hmm. It ma- makes a difference. Is, is, is a big deal. And I could never say officially, confidently, yes. Yeah, yeah. I have done pastoral work. I do past- I, I do the work of a pastor all the time. That, that was me. But I wasn't ordained. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's, a, there's a difference between like your gifting and your, your um, passion and drive mm-hmm. and the official office of yeah. it, right? Where I was for about seven or eight years, I was in the official capacity as an elder, teaching pastor mm-hmm. type of thing. And right now I'm currently not. And yet, obviously, through my YouTube channel and through different things, like I was, I actually spoke at a Kleine Gemeinde youth group uh, camp mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. July, I think it was. And oh. uh, we'll be in Alberta, Tabor area in November, preaching there. And then in, in Mexico in January. So I get some invites like that to still do pastoral preaching yes, type yes, of work yeah. and maybe there will be some future in that for me still I don't know mm-hmm. but as of right now I'm not in an official church leadership role right Right. yeah yeah. and, and, and it's kind of like me I am I'm, I'm recognized as a pastor and, and based upon that I was ordained and so that part is awesome but I get uh, a lot of invites different places mm-hmm. and so kind of like you and that part is it works works well i mean i right now i'm truly enjoying the work that i do and yeah that's cool yeah um you're uh you're pretty involved in the church there is there a website or a facebook page or anything like that that you would invite people to in arborg area um good question of course uh, there's the website for our church that i am part of but i'm not showing up there much um, either YouTube behind the channel, scenes, anything like that. I don't have nothing really um, that I would say. Um, the I work with a, another ministry that I haven't mentioned yet, called Eingloven. Okay. Um, that website is under development. If you go to eingloven.com, with the number one, like one, the number one Gloven Plotich L. Gloven is G L O O. O O W E N, yeah. So, you'll find some information there that I work part time for. 
So between Eingeloven and Men's Encounter, and then I have a little, a little website. So if you go to YouTube on just search for Kobe Weeb, you'll find a lot of messages there. Okay. Um, if you go to kobeweeb.com, you will find my straight line accounting business website. Okay. So you are still <laughs> doing a business besides ministry? Yeah. So I still do a little bit of accounting. And then in March and April, I do income tax. Yeah. Well, that keeps you which, pretty busy for which, a few months. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I haven't given that one up because I love it so much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a good way to sustain your ministry, too, I think. I, uh, I'm mostly uh, raising funds for ministry. But uh, it, the um, straight line accounting is, is is supplementing that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And you get some supplementation from the church then too. Or? Uh, the church and by donation, yeah. Church does some, Anglovan does some, and the rest is 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 by donation. Like I have to raise my own funds to there do ministry. Go. Yeah. Excellent. So I don't know if there was any other major thing. Usually we kind of wrap up just around an hour. We're a bit over now, but uh, <laughs> yeah. we, I'm sure we could go in a lot of different uh, directions. We still. could definitely. No, I, I think I, I think that um, for me, ministry is life. Uh, and it's just if I, if I can't give, then it feels empty. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we are we have freely received from Christ, we now give. Mm -hmm. And ministry looks different for every single person. I always say that if you're working at a job somewhere and you pour concrete all day or whatever you do, you're still in the ministry. Absolutely. Um, you can share the gospel with however, and if nothing else, simply by living a positive life. And providing a good service to people that yeah. en enriches their lives and all that. Yeah. If, if we understand that life is for Christ and whatever you do for Christ and you do your best with excellence um, however that might look for the mother at home cleaning dishes and changing diapers mm -hmm. is also a great ministry absolutely huge and, and so I like the idea that or I always say forget the the, the profession of ministry as a minister of religion or the predia or missionary mm -hmm. those are maybe doing full-time the work of the ministry or the kingdom but also full-time just in a different capacity as you absolutely. who are pouring concrete yeah absolutely um so it's just that's good i always uh, want to encourage people to just go out and be the best you can for christ amen well, that's good stuff excellent well i mean hopefully we can stay in touch and people will be blessed by this uh, story <laughs> yeah no, it's, it's good. Thank you for having me here. Right now. Okay. God bless.